Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, welcome to another edition of Mansfield Town News and Views. I'm joined with a very special guest today, uh, former Mansfield player Tony Lomore. Uh, first off, Tony, thanks for taking the time out of your morning to take part in this interview. Uh, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm very well. And first of all, thank you very much. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to um, obviously have a chat. And I'm sure we'll come across some interesting things. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're looking forward to it. Like, obviously, like you know, obviously, he was a player way before my time, so this will be like a massive eye opener for me as well. Like, <laughs> obviously, football was such a different time then, as uh, as you can imagine. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, times have changed quite a lot, you know. And uh, so, I had I had two years as a as a as, um, as a player, but I had a year as the commercial manager as well, which was quite an interesting viewpoint to see you see the other side of what what has to go on and what has to happen to make a football match happen really do you know what i mean and, and as a player you just turn up an hour or so before kickoff and expect everything's done for you you see so it was it was it was it's interesting to see both parties yeah just like after on the pitch and on the pitch like preparing things and uh yeah. Jeff, Talking briefly on the commercial manager at Mansfield that you had, uh, you know, a while back then. Um, so, what, what, um, what did you have to do in that role? So that was really just um, it was just bringing revenue into the football club, and we did that. Obviously, there was different means of doing that. So, shirt sponsors, advertising, uh, match day hospitality, you know, the board signage around the, the uh, around the pitch. So there was there was there was different ways of, of doing it. Um, what I sort of I wanted to get back into football. I didn't want to do the coaching, but so I did. I did the commercial manager's job, and I was part of the under thirteens and fourteens. Mm. Um, so it was it was it was a way. Of just I needed back into football. I wanted to get back into football. I'd had I'd done sales for quite a few years, and it mm. just ticked every box. You know, I was back in around football. Uh, Paul Holland and Billy Dearden were the manager at the time, mm. so. It was um, it was just a good fit, you know, and I really enjoyed it. To be honest, I mean, what I didn't realise was the obviously the history or the politics within the town, and, and obviously the owner. So it yeah. was quite it was quite a difficult job because there was a lot of people not wanting to invest their money. Uh, while obviously Keith was was still the owner, yeah. And, um, but it was a, it was it was a job I really really enjoyed, you know, and I made some good relationships with people, you know, made some good friendships. Yeah, and um, and I, and, to, and those friendships, you know, we still keep to to, to today, you know. So it's, it was fantastic, brilliant stuff. And it's always good when you can like you know get to get involved in the community and like bring people into the club. It's fantastic for everyone. So uh, you just briefly mentioned him, and I'm not going to mention him tonight or at all, really, with Keith Aslan, but uh, <laughs> but because um, obviously, is it some anniversary? I think is it some anniversary since John took over or something? Like, is it ten years or something? I seen something. Yeah, uh, yeah, something yeah, like that. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, did you have many like dealings with Keith then, or did you really see him or speak to him that much? Um, well, as commercial manager, obviously, I had an interview with him at the very beginning. Yeah, um, Keith. After that, I've saw very, very little of Keith for probably six months, and then the club. Obviously, we teeter in with. Uh, relegation, and then he started had, having a bit of a more of a present on on match days. Um, so yeah, so probably the probably the last two or three months of the season he was around a little bit more. But uh, I hate, we all we all know what what was happening. You know, Keith Keith. Yeah. You know, uh, I think he 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 had invested in the club for so long, and whatever he took in and took out, and however things go. I think you know he, he just got fed up with it as well, you know, and mm. and, and, it, and it was unfortunate because at the time, you know, the cl- the club. I mean, at the end of the season, we got relegated, you know, and yeah, well, I lost my job, people lost their jobs, a new obviously new consortium came in, and mm. and obviously that sort of helped with, with sort of change to the to the football club and in, 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 yeah, and in, in put that on a bit of a better path, really. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's uh, let's rewind. Uh, <laughs> start your career. Like, let's start off on a positive note. <laughs> so, I, but, so um, you started off at Walls End Boys Club, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, what was that like for you growing up as a young player? Like you know, uh, getting involved in football for the first time. Well, it was. Uh, what was it? We, we had, 
it was it was really strange because I, I, me dad me dad was a local footballer and, and played to a good level, mm. um, like at a non league level. So I was always involved in football in a very very young age. Um, yeah, Walton Boys Club was you know was just down the road from where we lived. We could go and five aside there. So for, I remember being six year old and playing and then playing five aside football. Obviously did quite well. Uh, a lot of my mates from school went. Um, and then I, from nine year old, I got asked to be involved for, with the under nines. Um, and that sort of took off from them. That was, uh, but what was really important was we had a really good school team as well. Mm. So we had a school team from being, oh gosh, what was it, 10, maybe 10, 11 year old. We never lost a game for three years until we lost our final game for th- at the end of the three years. Oh, wow. um, and so we had a fantastic school team. So that, sort of puts you in the spotlight. So if you've got a good school team, yeah. you usually have a good, you know, area team and stuff like that. And then Yeah. Um, so I was really, really lucky. Do you know what I mean? Very, very fortunate. Obviously I could play a little bit, but you have things have to fall into place, you know what I mean? And yeah. And I was I was I was about tw- I was twelve year old and I was about six foot. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was like a bit of a freak of nature. <laughs> uh, so I was like I was probably like a baby Peter Crouch, you know what I mean? I was <laughs> handly, do you know what I mean? I had massive feet and massive ears and uh, not like I was about four stone wet through and um, what was it? And it was, uh, and I just, but I just love playing football and I love scoring goals, you know? Yeah. And I was scoring loads of goals and then what well, I didn't realise New- uh, Wall's End was like a, a feeder club into Newcastle. Oh, wow. Um, so if you were well at Newcastle, if you did well at Wall's End, you got the opportunity to go and train in Newcastle. So, yeah, well, 12 year old, I went and played. I started training at Newcastle. Um, mm. So, but I was playing with under 14s because I was so tall. Yeah. Um, so, it was just a good grounding, really. It was just, and, and things just went into place. And mm. uh, I did really well at Wall's End. Uh, mm. My body fitted, sort of grew and fitted my feet and my ears mm. um, a little bit better. And it's 14, I was given the opportunity to have like a schoolboy. So I had 14 to 16, two years at Newcastle. So I was trained properly and very structured. Yeah. Um, and then as they say, the rest is history really. But again, it, it, you talk about luck and you talk about, you know, being at the right place at the right time and making decisions at a young age. And yeah, I mean, I mean, in Newcastle, you know, there's nothing else by the football club. Do you know what I mean? And you've got like, you got the rugby union team, and you've got a basketball team. Yeah, you know, you've got Durham Cricket Club down the road. Mm. Nobody gives a hoot apart from the football club, you know. And yeah, and you can imagine, can you imagine being fourteen year old and you having your careers meeting at school and yeah, you know, what you're going to be? And I'm going to say, well, I'm going to sign for Newcastle, and it's like, well, whoa, you know. And I was just, <laughs> but I was just driven. Do you know what I mean? Really mm. driven at a very very young age. Mm. To, to want to play football at, a, at, a, at obviously that level. Yeah, so football was something that you'd always wanted to do from a young age. Like that was the only thing you wanted to do as a, as a kid. Oh, it was the only thing I could do. You know, I was, I mean, I left school with no qualifications. Um, I mean, I had a, what was it? I got, well, I got, believe it or not, I got a qualification in English and P. So um, I even failed my maths. Um, so it was, um, so yeah, when I left school, it, the other thing that drove you on is, I had nothing else to fall back on, really. It it had to work. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, and and in going into that arena at fourteen, yeah. fifteen year old, I was involved with the youth team, but the youth team played in an under nineteen league. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was just, and it just, it just, I just grew up very, very quickly, you know, and mm. uh, in in a very, very tough environment. Yeah, and like you mentioned there, obviously playing for Newcastle under 14 to that, that must have been a, a huge thing for any young player. Like, because in them days, obviously, was it like you was an apprentice as well? Like, obviously, was mm. that as well? Because obviously, back in them days, you had to like clean dressing rooms, boots. Yeah. You couldn't imagine doing that to young players nowadays. Wow. <laughs> it's funny, we were talking about this a few weeks ago with, with one of the lads uh, from Newcastle. Um, so, yeah, we, I mean, yeah, we, we had jobs to do, so we had the boots to clean. Uh, we had all the kit to put out. I yeah. was, we were given three professionals to look after. I had the club captain of the oh, nice. of Newcastle, you know, Glenn Roder. Nice. Um, 
and we had some fun, fantastic uh, young. Uh, we had some fantastic pros. Yeah, who really set a good standard, mm. you know, and, and worked and really worked off that. And without without realizing at the time those yeah. standards that were set, and by Wolves and and by the youth set up at Newcastle, mm-hmm. was uh, you know they just set good standards and. Uh, just like good manners, do you know what I mean? Be on time, you know what I mean? Yeah. Clean, you know, you, you turn it with clean boots and stuff like that. Just little things, but set you up, set you up for life, really. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think as well, it's like not just from a footballing aspect, but I suppose for you at the time, it must have been like a massive thing for you to like mature as well for like any young player as well. Like, you know, and I think that's what some young players just like nowadays, in my opinion, it's just either they're too busy like with technology, just going out or the nightlife and just, I mean, obviously football's changed as, as we've said, like, but yeah. you know, for you, it was like a massive, massive learning curve for you growing up then. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And it's life skills, you know, and I mean, you know, I'll, you know, it's, it's I always remember, like as a young lad and all that, and it's you hear the older pros talk about certain things, and you think, oh god, I never, I never get to that age. And now, I'm an age now of where you look back and you think, oh well, the young of today and all that. And I sound like, yeah, <laughs> all that, you know what I mean? But it's like, um, it's, it's it. I mean, it, but things evolved. You know what I mean? It was, it's been 20 yeah. years since I've retired. You know what I mean? So things will yeah. evolve, and yeah. I think, uh, but I mean. It's all all little things. Was like at sixteen, you you leave school, you become a, a, an apprentice. Yeah. And but then all of a sudden, you know, at them days, obviously Saturday night you, you you'd go out. You know, Saturdays you'd go out, and then there was nightclubs, and you could smoke in nightclubs and stuff like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. And then you had to recover on a Sunday so you could train on a Monday. It was just loads of things, and yeah. Like you say, I, it well, at fifteen, I was involved with the youth team. As soon as I went in and started as an apprentice, um, I, I, my, I played the first game for the reserves, the first game of the season. So I was playing for the youth team, the reserves. So um, so you just play football all the time, and it it was just fantastic. And again, you talk about you talk about how things fall into place, and you talk about luck. We had a we had a first team coach with with Newcastle who used to be the youth team manager, hmm. and he he implemented a pro a program where. On a Tuesday, if there wasn't a game, two apprentices were going to train with the first team just oh, to wow. get an idea of like standards and how you know yeah. the difference and stuff like that. Yeah. And then, um, and and I, and I and I just I remember going across and just loved it. You know, what I mean? and and that I mean that era, Paul Gascoigne was there. You know, so he, he was training mm. with Paul Gascoigne, and nice. that, that was his last year at um, Newcastle before he signed for Spurs. Yeah, uh, but you had like. Dave McCreary, who just come back from the World Cup with Northern Ireland, you know, I mentioned Glenn Roder. Um, what was it? We had young lads who were playing in the Ireland squads and Scotland squads, and you just, mm. you know, it was, it was fantastic. It was just a massive learning curve. Mm. And things like, so, so what happened was, as an apprentice, you have to, you'd go with you, you'd go away with the first team. And yeah. Basically, you'd, you'd be on the skips. Do you know what I mean? So basically, yeah. you'd, you'd be kit man really in in, <laughs> in, in the gopher. Mm. So there was a game we trained. We trained in the morning, and I even think I trained in the afternoon with the youth team. And there was a game. The first team were playing a game at Queen of the South, and we were we were opening the floodlights. I think it was on the ground or something there. Yeah. And um, so I was like, so I'd been training, so I had my kit bag with this. So yeah. obviously I had my stuff inside. So I took my kit bag onto the bus. Yeah. Put all the skips on, you know, you, you're there making cups of tea and yeah. all the lads on the bus and that. So he gets so he gets to the ground and the the first team co- the first team coach he said he says, Oh you've got your kit he says, Look, he says, get all the kit out. He says you may what you may as well do is stick your kit on and yeah. just go and warm up with the lads and just see what it's like, you know. So I'm obviously I'd been training in the morning with them, so in there he, so we, we we're just warming up and we're just doing the, the normal stuff. Yeah. And then he then he, I came in and he went. It was a friendly. So he says, "Look, he says, chuck a kit on, all right, just mm-hmm. in case anything happens, chuck a kit on." And, and yeah, and it. So I was like, "Bloody hell!" So I was sat on the bench all of a sudden, and then ten about know, ten fifteen minutes in, one of the centre forwards mm. gets a bit of an injury, and 
obviously they needed they wanted to play sat and stuff like that. So it was like the look around the bench. I was only I was the only forward on the bench. <laughs> so like literally 15, 20 minutes, they went, Oh, get yourself on, get yourself warmed up, you're going on, sort of thing. Right. <laughs> and I went on and, and scored. And, <laughs> and then and I played really well and enjoyed it and you know what I mean? And then as I mentioned before, the rest is history, really, you know. I, yeah. Then all of a sudden you train him you train him over the first team and then you travel with a few squads and then mm. um I was given a professional contract on my seventeenth birthday at the end of the October. Mm. Christmas came around, I was sub for the first team at St James's Park and we played Spurs. Mm. Uh, I got thrown on for the last two minutes, just as a mm. sort of talking effort, but I mean, I six, 17 year old, I'd made my debut for Newcastle against Tottenham at St James's Park, and I mean, just think, bloody hell, like, yeah, not even what we know, not even six months ago, I was still at school, you know. So, <laughs> so yeah, so it was just a rapid, rapid rise, you know, playing playing at that at that level, which I loved, you know. What I mean, it was fantastic. It was my hometown club. Yeah, I wanted to do really. Yeah, I mean that from a young any young player when you've played in front of a big atmosphere that must have been um, insane. You know what was going through your head at that time when you was playing in front of so many fans at St James's Park? Yeah, it was mad. It was mad. In, in them days, I, I had a, I think I had a car. I'm not sure if I had a car now, but I remember getting the bus. I got the bus to my first Newcastle match. Mm. Uh, you know, I sat in the bus with all the fans. Yeah, and walking through town, nobody knew who I was. You know, and then. Obviously, so you're walking through with the fans, and then you're walking to the ground, and mm. you're walking to the change rooms, and and then I remember playing, being involved, and then when you finish, I remember getting the bus home amongst all the fans. Nobody knew it was nobody. You know, I just sat there on the bus, and you know what <laughs> I mean. So it was it was just a really, at the time, you know what I mean. It, it's no difference to what you've done in the rest of your, you know, last six, eight, twelve months, but. When you look back at it, it's you know, it's when I go when I go to the castle matches as a fan nowadays, you know, you just see yeah. you, know, uh, you don't have nobody has that contact with with, with yeah. the, the players and as you probably well know even at Mansfield. So Yeah. Um so yeah, it just had the time like, things change and, and things are different. Yeah, that's it. Like times have changed, like like we said earlier on. Um, so obviously, only had a short, brief period at Newcastle first team, and then you went uh, got loaned out to Norwich for a bit, um, and then yeah. Lincoln City was where you really hit the ground running in terms of your goal scoring. Like um, you know, thirty goals in hundred appearances, if I'm not mistaken. You know, oh, that, yeah. I mean, Jesus, you must have played around some really good players for you to get that amount of goals. Well, well so, 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 I talk, so I talk, so I talk, so, um. So I mentioned the first team coach in Newcastle quite a lot. So there's a guy called John Pickering. And uh, so when I was younger, there was a guy called Brian Clark who did the Wolves End stuff. And he developed me. And then I was involved with a guy called Peter Kirkley. Who's, well, these guys are well known in the Northeast. And then from there, in the youth system, was a guy called John Pickering. He was first team coach in Newcastle. And then he was, at the time, he was first team coach at Lincoln. All oh, right, okay. So, so he rang me up and just said, like, you fancy coming down, play some games. Yeah. Um, he says, let's just get you playing loads of games. And if you score a load of goals, someone will come in and buy you. Do you know what I mean? That's that's how it is. So, yeah. So at 19, I decided to to leave home. Um, there was just um, my brother and my mum. And my mum and dad had split up and stuff like that. So it was quite a big thing yeah. at a young age to do at 19. So, but I decided, you know, I trusted John a lot. And I just thought, well, let's go and play some football. I had, I had an ego even at 19. Do you know what I mean? I wanted to play in front of, you know, I wanted to be in the newspaper and I want to score goals and I want to, you know, people recognise me and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, well, let's have a go. And yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a, so I was 19 and I was very fit and quick and raw. Yeah. But there was a, there was a guy there called um, Gordon Hobson, who played up front really late. So at the time, he was probably in and around his 30s. And just an old head, which I taught and learned a lot from him. There was a guy there called Steve Thompson, who was the club captain, who was a centre half, mm. played at a very high level. Uh, just, just ground you, do you know what I mean? So you, you never get too ahead of yourselves. And but we had we had some really good young players. You know, we had Shane Nicholson. Mm. Um, so at the time, he 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 made his debut at sixteen for Lincoln, I think, and. Mm. By this time, he's three years. You know, he's had three full seasons for Lincoln, and then 
he goes out to West Brom and, and Derby and stuff like that. So, yeah. so we did have a we had a we had a fairly good team. Uh, yeah. You know, we had um, what was it? We had the opportunity to play and and yeah, we were just sort of we had we, our manager was a guy called Colin Murphy and I was quite well known in the lower leagues. You know, and he, you know, he. he he ruled by an iron rod, but was very, very fair, you know. And if he played well, he told you. If he played bad, he'd tell you. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just, I mean, the the, the Lincoln time was fantastic. It was it was brilliant. Um, the only obviously the, the issue I had was I think a couple of years in, I, I snapped me. I was in the training session. I snapped, I snapped every ligament ligament in my right knee. You know, so. Um, so you usually hear people are snapping their anterior cruciate. Well, I, I snapped my ante- anterior cruciate and my posterior cruciate mm-hmm. ligament. So the two main ligaments in your knee, I didn't play for 16 months. Mm-hmm. I had about five or six operations on my knee. Mm-hmm. Um, I could never bend it and straighten it fully ever again. And, and at that time, I knew, I knew I was never going to get back to the level yeah. of, um, um, of playing at that Premier League Championship level again, you see, and yeah, um, and I, I made a, I made a, I should have retired, but I didn't, I couldn't retire because I, I didn't know what else to do. Yeah, and I, and I, I sort of, at the end days, you could get your pension when you were thirty-five. You see, oh wow. <laughs> so I just thought, right, I'll try and make as much money as I can until I'm thirty-five and retire, and then see what was what. So if I was being honest. I became a little bit of a mercenary or do you know what I mean? I didn't chase the money, but I just thought if there was an opportunity to move to a club and, and yeah. get paid a little bit more, I, I did it really. And I suppose at the time you're young and naive, but you just think, I just thought I have to get a 35, you know? So. Yeah. So that's what I mean. I think this is what a lot of people forget, you know, especially lower league clubs, obviously like when players, players are free agents because obviously they've still got a family to support and, you know, yeah. So it's like it doesn't matter where you play. Sometimes it's just like as long as you're getting getting something to support your family, because that's a huge thing. And a lot of people forget that. I think in just in life in general, to be fair. No, it's true. Yeah, yeah. And I and I I, 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 I believe I'm an honest person. And I like every club I went to, I always you know I would never cheat or hide or mm. you know. And I always I always tried my best because I knew I was very limited in my abilities, and I knew if I worked really hard, then. Yeah, so that was that was that was a core skill, and, and if you look after, I uh, look after my injury. Um, I, uh, I I just became a bit of a target man and a workhorse. Do you know what I mean? And mm. and I, and I just what I did the well, I was I was quite good at. It. I, I knew my limitations. Do you know what mm. I mean? So there's no point in me trying to run defenders and try and sprint past them and stuff like that. I had to wear people down, and I had to do that through hard work and. But also, if you work really hard and you're honest, and you know, clubs and fans will accept you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and apart from Preston, the time I my time at Preston, I think every club I was at, every club sort of accepted mm. me quite well. Even Mansfield fans after I'd played for Chesterfield. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just going to get onto that point because obviously yeah. before you before you went to Chesterfield, obviously you played at um, obviously Halifax and. Uh, Peterborough as well briefly, but obviously yeah. just, even though it's Chesterfield, uh, I'll, I'll make an exception this time. Um, you know, you did have a, again, again another goal scoring record for you as well, thirty five goals and one hundred thirteen appearances. Again, it's it must have been amazing for you on a personal level because obviously with that injury as well and to just, just still score them goals, it's, it must give you a massive confidence boost. Yeah, it was, and, and see th- things people and I don't. I don't so what happened was I signed for Peterborough, and I signed for Peterborough. I, go, I played. I went on trial. I turned up the trial match. Yeah. And, uh, I was the only person who got off for the contract. I, I got off for twelve months, and the manager at the time had a big squad, and he wanted rid of a lot of people. Yeah. So, um, so to pay a lot of people off, we would play two reserve matches a week. Hmm. So we play a Tuesday night and a Wednesday afternoon. Okay. But a Tuesday night we could be a Dagenham. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, and then a Wednesday afternoon it could be a home match. Mm. Now, in a, and he was he obviously wanted to, like you say, the senior pros he wanted rid of, and so he was just trying to upset them. But because I hadn't played for eighteen months, yeah, it was the best thing that could happen to me. And I was playing, I spent two games a week, and then 
Yeah. You know, you get a game, you know, maybe so on Saturday and stuff like that. So the time of pre- the time of Peterborough was just what I needed. And I went into so I went into obviously Chesterfield and I was just fit as a butcher's dog, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then we hit the ground running. I think we had we had a we had that obviously uh, a run where I think we didn't lose for twenty one games and then mm-hmm. and obviously uh, we we got promoted to the playoffs in that first year yeah and then the men- momentum carried us on we had a good year the year after then there was the semi final mm-hmm. um, which I played in the first three rounds and got injured after that um, yeah so in that four years we had you know we had quite a lot of success and. From mm-hmm. a personal point of view, it, we, I played in a team that didn't score a lot of goals and was quite defensive. But yeah. you know, again, I, I came out with quite a good scoring record. And mm-hmm. um, see, and, and you know, things happen, and I just felt I needed a change. Preston came in. We 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 weren't massively well paid at, at, at Chesterfield, and yeah, uh, I got phone calls from Preston who were who were who were renowned for being quite good peers yeah. and um and i thought oh what's well, not opportunity and i did i just thought well things and things were going sour it you know things needed to change at chesterfield you know john duncan the manager was brilliant with us but you know he needed a change and yeah the evolving squad and stuff like that so at the time it looked like a good fit and um it was mm-hmm. probably the it's probably the unfortunately the you know the the worst six months i had as a professional footballer, mm. uh, but not for the lack of trying to a certain extent. It was just, yeah, you know, so you, you, you like ch- change rooms are massive. You know what I mean? The change room was split. The manager got the sack who signed me after six weeks. Yeah. David Moyes took over. Do you know what I mean? And he was brilliant. He was dead honest with me. And yeah, but it was, it was just never going to happen to be honest. And yeah, I remember I bumped into Steve Park and he had a match. I can't remember. I, you know, he just bumped into people and he was like, saying, yeah. oh, you know, he says, we've got a team which would be a perfect fit for you, you know, but he says, we'll never be able to afford you. Mm. And I was just like, well, well, let's sit down, do you know what I mean? Let's mm. see if we sort something out, you know what I mean? And yeah, I took a, quite a big drop in money-wise to come to, to Mansfield. And, but that wasn't it. It was about playing football and enjoying life again, really. And I know I mentioned earlier about being a mercenary to a certain extent, but you want to be playing football and you want to enjoy yourself, you know what I mean? And, yeah, and, of course. And that's why I, I, I enjoyed... I joined Mansfield because I wanted to play football again, you know. Yeah, I mean, like you said earlier, when we, you know, um, straight away, obviously from a young age, that's all we wanted to do is play football. And even though we had to drop uh, wages, obviously, it's just you could be you could be sat around waiting for ages for any club to come into. You, so yeah. it was just one of them, you know. Um, when you first joined Mansfield, then what was your impressions of it, uh, the town in general, the supporters? What was your first thoughts on Mansfield when you joined? Well, it was funny because. I've, and I've told this story like a few times, and I you know I. So the rivalry between Chesterfield and Mansfield, I didn't realise was as bad yeah. <laughs> until I signed for Mansfield. Yeah. Because the, the semi final, the playoff semi final was just like, you just thought that was just a normal game, do you know what I mean? Because that, that was always going to be a high, high pressurised game. Yeah. And when I was at Chesterfield, all they ever talked about was Rotherham and Sheffield, you see. Yeah. And I presumed. Because Mansfield always took a massive following in North County. Yeah, I thought Mansfield's rivals were County, and I thought Chesterfield's rivals were Sheffield clubs. You see, yeah. Right. <laughs> and then, um, and I and I never realised until I until I signed for Mansfield how an, the animosity was between the two clubs. Yeah, and it, the fir- the first time it really hit home was I remember get I think I, this was a like pre season friendly, and I was getting my stuff out the back out of the boot of my car. And there was a dad, and I think his daughter, like a young daughter, walked past the back of the car. Yeah. He said something, oh, is that one of the players? And he went, yeah, but he, he used to be a blue. Mm. And just carried on walking. Mm. And you just go, <laughs> what, have I, just, what, what have I landed in? Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. You know? And I was like, oh, that's fair enough. And then, then obviously very, very quickly, I got an understanding of what was going on. But Yeah. I mean, I know... I mean, like the thing I, I liked about Steve Parkin was really honest guy. Do you know what I mean? Really, I mean, down to the, the bones of the earth, he was brilliant. Yeah. But um, I knew John Schofield. I knew Ian Bowling. Do you know what I mean? I, I knew I played against obviously 
all, all of the lads that were there. And I knew they were good set of lads, you know, and I just thought, well, in things like training grounds, stands, attendances, really go out of the wind a little bit. You, yeah. you, know, you have that camaraderie within a, within a, within a, a group of, mm. probably of players. And that's sometimes a lot more important than, you know what I mean, bits and bobs like, you know, the club. And I had no idea. I had some idea. I knew the club financially wasn't a great place. I knew players hadn't been paid in the past. I knew, obviously, people got paid late and stuff like that. So, yeah. Well, like, things like that, you, you, you can sort of take with a pinch of salt to a certain extent because you, you want to play football, do you know what I mean? And yeah. you know, there was a group of people I knew quite well. So, you know, at the, at the time... Well, for the two years, it was a perfect fit, really. Yeah, and like, obviously, you know, you got 20 goals from Mansfield and 74 appearances at the club. And you mentioned a couple of players there that you obviously knew before um, going into the club. Um, so, you know, it was one of them that you had really good service then in the team as well at Mansfield then. You know, where what players really, you know, did you enjoy playing with the most? So, yeah, like I said, I got on really well. Like the senior guys, you know, Lee Williams. Um, God, they're going back now. Um what was it? There was there's some there's some really really good lads, and look young lads as well. You you, you want to help us to come through. So um, obviously we had Chris Greenacre. Uh, I think he came on loan from Man City when Lee yeah. Seacock. You know I, uh, I had obviously some time with Lee. Lee was a fantastic person and a really good guy, mm. uh, really good player. Um, we so we we had we had some really good players. I think Christie. Do you know what I mean? You think of the lads who played up front. Um, and then, and then coming through, you know, you had your um, oh gosh, uh, Liam Lawrence, but Bobby Hassel, yeah, you know, that era. Do you know what I mean? Who were young apprentices? Um, so the club, was, the club had some really, really good players. You know, I think there was there were again, you go back to a lack of investment and stuff like that. I think yeah. we, um, what was it? The, the first twelve months. You know, yeah. I never really realised, you know, the, probably the financial situation of the club. It was only till the, the summer of the next year that, you know, things started, mm. you know, just to wonder what, like, what's going on here sort of thing. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we had some great players, you know, really, and, and good characters and good people. Do you know what I mean? Good, honest, yeah. hard-working people, you know. So. What, uh, what did you make of the fans then? You know, was they, did you always find them supportive to you? You know, what was it like uh, playing in front of the Mansfield fans? So, again... Really honest. So yes, do you know what I mean? I took some stick for about two or three months or a couple of months, which you can you can understand. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I totally appreciate that. But what what was what I found really good was I always remember we, we it was the game against Brentford. We played Brentford at home, and at the time Brentford were paying big money. I think they just paid a million quid from somebody from they had the owner the old owner from Crystal Palace at the time. Mm. So Brentford even in what would it be then, league? Well, Division Four, if you want to call it that. You know, yeah. paying massive money, and um, and I hadn't scored. Do you know what I mean? And you just things are lingering, and you know, and I just, we played and we absolutely battered them. Do you know what I mean? And I just remember <laughs> like, the first minute going in for a tackle and just going through somebody, and it just raised the whole crowd. And mm. uh, and I remember scoring, and that was a big relief. You know, you always want to get off the mark quite early. Yeah, and they sort of accepted us from there on in. And, and when I said earlier on about being hardworking and honest, yeah. people appreciate that, you know. And I think, again, if you spoke to anybody, my uh, my abilities were limited, do you know what I mean? And again, I, I knew what I could do. And, yeah. You know what I mean? And there, there was no point in me trying to outrun defenders and dribbling through, you know what I mean, yeah. four or five defenders. I controlled the ball, passed it to somebody who was better than me, and got in the box. Do you know, yeah. I mean? that's that's literally how it worked. You know, and I was lucky because I, Stan Lee, Chrissy Green, or got young lads, and they could do a lot of the sprinting and running around. So, yeah, definitely. And I think even now, to this day, to be fair, I still think it remains the best time for like the young players are coming through at Mansfield because you look at what they've done in the career since then. You know. Oh, yeah. Premiership and internationals, and you know, obviously, when you was playing at the time, you know, you, you saw these as young lads. So even then, you saw they had like massive potential there. Well, yeah, you just you just look at you look at youth systems throughout the football clubs, football leagues, and Premier League, and see how many players actually come through. 
Yeah. Very, very few. But you go yeah. back to the to the system Mansfield had set up, and again, as a as a player, you don't appreciate that. But I know, obviously, Stuart Watkins was the uh, Watkins was the um, was the youth team coach. Yeah. And obviously, he was bringing through so many players, and phew, I, I would I would guess <laughs> probably ninety percent of the players he had came through and either played in the first team or went on to, do you know, what I mean, had bigger and better careers. And yeah, um, yeah. So uh, and the club make you know, club makes makes money out of that. Do you know what I mean? In which. Yeah, you know, if you look at a business sense, that's they had they had a perfect system at the time, and mm. some and some good lads. Do you know what I mean? Re- really, really, really good, good young lads. Yeah, and right. good people as well. Do you know what I mean? Not just good players, good people as well. You know. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, what would you say out of all the time that is um, Stags? What would you say was your best moment, like the best game that you've played under, like you know, in your time at Stags? So from a personal point of view, it would have been that Brentford game. Do you know what I mean? It was a big game for us. It was a big game for me. Uh, ch- changed and turned um, a lot of fans onto my side. Yeah. Um, so that was a big turning point. Um, we, I mean, we didn't have a lot of success. I think we finished 10th both seasons I was there. Do you know what I mean? So there wasn't, you know, we, we weren't really near the playoffs. You know, we, you know, Ultimately, it was a very sort of frustrating two years to a certain extent. But we, you know, we played Forest in the in the um, you know in the League Cup back then, home and away. So I remember the the home leg. We got beaten the first leg three 0 but the home leg uh, we won one 0 And I remember the atmosphere on a Tuesday night. It's always a brilliant night. So yeah, that was you know uh, that was a really good night. Um, yeah. But I think if, if, if you go like over two years. There wasn't massively many highlights, do you know what I mean? And that's that's yeah. a frustrating point of view. You you always want to go to a club and make an impact, and hopefully the club does better. But yeah, it didn't quite work out at Mansfield from a, like getting promoted or anything yeah. else, things like our cup runs, you know. So yeah, I mean, you obviously mentioned earlier, you know, like um, you played obviously a higher league before, and then coming down to lower league. Did you know it's a difference in, in the style, or did you just still play the same? Did you know it's any difference in quality? You know, what was the differences? Would you say at that time? Um. Not really. The different. I mean, from my point of view, it didn't really change. What you have is probably at that time and now is the better players in the league above, or better than the better players, which is obvious. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. So the, the you know, so if you go the, to the the players at um, it, it, Preston, so young players coming through. Uh, mm-hmm. Michael Appleton being at Man U, obviously had a really good career. Lincoln manager John Mackin. Mm-hmm. John Mackin sort of took my place at Preston and then they sold him for eight million quid or something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, Sean Gregan, do you know what I mean? Played at a very, very high level, good lower league player. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's just the, the difference, you know what I mean? The the, the, the top four or five percent of the, the players in, the, in that league are, you know, are very, 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 very good. Yeah, definitely. And um, obviously, after Mansfield, you went to Hartlepool United, you played a lot of games there. So, when your time did come to an end at Mansfield, was it a shock to you, or did you really want to leave? You know, how did that come about? You know, <laughs> so, the reason, the reason I laugh is uh, so obviously, I've told, I've told this story before. So, um, we, as so I've been at Mansfield for two years, and uh, so it's like a third pre season, and then we're coming to the end. So, we played Notts County, which is the last pre season game of, of pre season, obviously. Yeah. So that's usually the team that will play for the first game of the season. Yeah. So we've got North County and we've got be 2 0. I think County were in the league above us. And we got a bit of a, although it was only 2 0, we got a bit of a chase into be honest. We, you know, we we didn't play well and it was a hot day. And I remember mm. being really frustrated and had, had sort of, you know, had a little bit of an argument with the coach at the end about our tactics and stuff like that. But as a player, do you know, you barely we just chased the ball for ninety minutes. Yeah, and um, so, so I had a shower, finished the game, and I, I lived in Lincoln at the time. So I've left Nottingham and gone yeah. to Lincoln, and so I guess guess that gets home to Lincoln, and uh, I spoke to my wife at the time, and she said, "Oh, she says uh, Billy Dearden's running. She says, can you ring him back?" Mm. I thought, oh, I'm going to get a bit of a ticking off. Yeah. <laughs> And stuff like that, you know, which is fair enough. What I understand, 
So I ring him up and he goes, uh, look, he says, uh, chairman sold you. <laughs> oh, damn. And I went, oh, what? <laughs> she says, yeah, he says, yeah, he says, uh, he says Hartlepool were at the game and they've put a bid in for you and chairman's accepted it. So this this is now Saturday night. So he said, uh, if you want, we'll give you permission to go and speak to Hartlepool. Okay. So like, All right. But so you just go like so just you know, people talk about the glamorous side of professional football, but I mean yeah. you've been sold within an hour of finishing the football matches. Mm. Um so I was like, All right, so um Right, so I'll re- so I obviously I had a number I had to ring uh, Hartlepool manager Chris Turner. So I ring ring Chris up and says, "Oh, what's what?" And he says, "Look, he says this is what we're after." He says, "You fit the bill. Mm-hmm. We want you to play first game of the season. So can you come up tomorrow night, or can you be up Sunday night? We'll have a meeting Monday morning." And I, so you just go like, so your life just turns around. And yeah, and obviously I was from the northeast, and my wife, I said, my wife at the time, she was from the northeast, and we had two kids, two children, and. Just seemed a perfect fit to move back home, and I knew that was going to be my last club because when I was at Mansfield, I was starting to struggle with my knee, and yeah, I had um, I had quite a lot of not injuries, but I had a lot of issues with my with 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 my knee during games and stuff like that. So I knew I had floating bits and floating bits of bone in my knee and stuff like that. So, and that was again. I knew I knew Hartlepool were paying quite a lot of money, and I just thought it was an opportunity to, you know, what I mean, it was a way of getting back to the northeast. Yeah, it was also a way of prolonging my career, and obviously, you know, just it, it was a bit of a few a few extra quid. I thought would would be very helpful. Um, and I, I signed for I signed for Hartlepool, and then within about three or four months, I was in the hospital with my knee. So, mm. um, which was really really disappointing you know I'd, you know you never want to do that and you never want to try and fleece people you know and pull the wool over anybody's eyes and it was mm-hmm. just something that you know i just I, there's something that was unavoidable really and i yeah and then almost from that operation my, my, my career with, with hartlepool went rapidly downhill to be honest yeah and just briefly just before that incident with bill did yeah. Uh, what was uh, what was your relationship like with Bill, like overall at Mansfield then? So yeah, I got on really well with Bill. He was very, very honest. Again, um, he would just do little things like um, we would have practice matches and stuff like that. I remember one practice match. We were, we'd started the season off not great. Mm. Uh, when he was in, he just came up to me, just tapped me on the back and went, I need a bit more from you, big man. And I was just like, right, that, that's all he said and walked off. It was almost in passing, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I knew, right, all right, I got it. You know, I mean, you, you've got to up your game a little bit. And that was, he, he just had little things like that. But he, as a person, he was brilliant. You know what I mean? He, he was just so enthusiastic. Yeah. I mean, he, he came in, he he, he 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 took over when we had a really, when the problems really hit with the financial side of things. and. He yeah. joined, you know, I think we had five people signed on his for that for that season. Mm. He sort of had to sign a squad the week before the season started. First game of the season, we went to Brighton, who had just moved to the with team. We got done 6 1 at Brighton. We had a player sent off after 10 15 minutes, mm. and then we had Forest away on the Tuesday night. And we went to Forest and we got done 3 0, but we played quite well. But I was tell the story. We had to ask Forrest for for bandages because we had no tie ups and you know we didn't have medical equipment. And, um, and then we got Forrest at home, obviously the week after and won, and that sort of put us onto a bit of a you know a bit of a m- momentum. But Billy was brilliant, really, and I've seen him a few times since. You know, what I mean, he, I like honest people. Do you know what I mean? And if, yeah. if you've done well, they will tell you, and if you've done bad, they will tell you. You know what I mean? So yeah. Definitely. Which you don't always get in football, do you know what I mean? But <laughs> I have had some very, very honest people, you know, and mm. Billy, Billy was, was perfect. And yeah. He's a nice man and a gentleman as well, so yeah. Definitely. So that's what I think anyone needs in life anyway. Just tell them if you're bad at something, just, just say, just be, honest is the best policy, you know. Um, so you know what's happening in football, I promise you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, especially with agents nowadays, like you know, they're the worst. I think agents are terrible. So obviously, with you, like, obviously, did you have an agent? Or was it just yourself? No, I, I never had an agent. It was never really the thing at the time. Yeah, um, I used a guy when I signed for Preston, who was a businessman, 
Uh, but I, I don't know if it did. I don't know if it got me any extra money or what. Or I have no idea. But um, <laughs> so yeah, I used I used somebody once, and then after that, I was I was I was never in the game of you know uh, my what was it property rights or my uh, yeah my intellectual <laughs> property rights or whatever it's called nowadays. So, well, it was basically like you got your wages, your gold bonus, and then. Yeah, the parents were not the same on thing. That was about it, really. So, yeah, that was that. Um, so, obviously, for Hartlepool, you said there, you know, when you joined them, you, your injury, you got um, you got that which ruled you out for a while, and after that, then you went to non-league clubs and that. And was that just basically you could just feel it inside you that you didn't really have long left in your career then? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. what what had happened was I I was out with the team at the first I, I was out the first year at Hartlepool. We got the we ended up in the playoffs. And I remember playing it. We played the first leg at Blackpool, and I didn't. I didn't play particularly well. And we had the second leg at home, and I got dragged after an hour. And you know, when you just know things, things weren't you know going well. Um. So the second season, I went on loan to Shrewsbury, mm. um, and I had I had a really good month at Shrewsbury. Really mm. enjoyed it. Um. And on the back of that, when I got released by Hartlepool, uh, I got phone calls from Telford really, and they said, you know, do you want to? But they were part time. They only trained Tuesdays and Thursdays, although they were in the National League, what it is now. And uh, I was like, well, I could train, I could go to the gym and, you know, my days off and stuff like that. And it just never materialised. And I knew my career was, was over. Uh, and it, it got to the Christmas. And I went and seen the manager and just said, look, this is not working for either of us. And you spend your money on somebody else, really. And and I had it. I was. I was. I was. I was done with football. To be honest, I'd had enough of it. Uh, you know what I mean. And um, I had some really good times. Did I sort of left on a bitter, bitter end. Mm. A bit of taste in my mouth. Yeah. About a few decisions and about a few things that happened. But all in all, you just wanted to leave. You know, and, and go. Well, you know that was a that was a, a good chapter of my book. And yeah. Um, I wasn't quite ready for what was coming up, to be honest. And funny enough, after retiring for about ten years, my life was a mess. Do you know, what I mean, it was pretty horrific. So, yeah, and obviously, in 2011, obviously, he was diagnosed with, um, you know, cancer. And at, that, at the time, you know, what was um, what was your initial reaction to that when you found out that news? Yeah, well, it was all funny. Funny how things come along. Because I've just, I've just said, like, I had ten years when my life was a mess. Yeah. And, um, and I literally just got my life back on track. So uh, I just got myself into a place where things sort of, um, I was a massive drinker. So I was like, I stopped drinking and I sort of, you know what I mean? Just became a lot healthier and sort of looking after myself and yeah. made decisions to do the right things. And then, um, um, and yeah, so I, um, I got a job. I was kept man at Chesterfield at the time and mm. um, I found a lump on my neck. And within, that was probably August time. By by time Christmas come around, I'd been diagnosed with cancer. So, mm. so that was just over nine years ago. Um, and to be honest, the sounds daft. That that diagnosis was probably the best thing that could happen to us because mm. it gave me a kick up the arse. It gave me a focus. It gave me a purpose in life. And mm. I'd only I'd only just lost my mum through cancer the year before I got diagnosed. You see, so. Yeah, I just thought it, I mean, it took three years to kill my mum, so I just thought, all right, this is going to, I'm going to die fairly soon, so let's do something with my life, you know. And yeah, um, so yeah, so I sort of changed my outlook and everything really. And um, may like say it sort of put me in a track and a focus of, of, of I wanted to try and help. In fact, I'll be, I'll be totally honest, I wrote down a piece of paper, I wanted to change the world, yeah, but I'm not going to do that, but I thought, well. If I you know if I change myself and then I have this ripple effect, I might help some people in and around us. And yeah, and I've been really fortunate. I mean, I've been diagnosed uh, on four other occasions now with with the same cancer. So I have an incurable cancer, but at times it's manageable. Um, and I have I've had some fantastic fantastic opportunities in in trying to help as many people as I can. Um, and that's not trying to be. You know, what I mean, godlike and you know, spiritual and all that. Just, I just think from I have an opportunity to to sort of help and share my experiences with other people, and I've done that with children's at school and you know doing assemblies and I've done talks with 
NCS groups and um, and then obviously going through adults and, and share, try and share my story and my experiences and try and help others. So mm. it has been, <laughs> when I talk about getting diagnosed first time around, it was, you know, it was, it, it was what I needed. It was a kick in the backside that, you know, mm-hmm. you, you have a purpose and and for the first time set down a few goals and that looks what I wanted to do. And yeah. I mean, what was it? So about well, nearly three years ago, I, it came back in a, in a highly aggressive, almost un, unmanageable account. So um, I had six months where I was in hospital for near enough all all those six months and the hospital in Chesterfield couldn't find a chemotherapy to get my cancer under control. I then got transferred to Sheffield and um, in the end they had to give me a stem cell transplant, um, which was fairly horrific, but saved my life. Yeah. And, um, and I'm just, since then I've just done a course, a two year program, which finishes in the beginning of April. Hmm. And as we speak, I've had every every bit of treatment that I possibly have to to get my cancer under control or to manage it. So, mm. um, so but the thing is, I live with is that it will come back. Do you know what I mean? Depending on the scale of it coming back, will depend on the outcome really. And to a certain extent, you, you know, you, you can say, "Well, I sit here and I live on borrowed time," mm. but I also sit here and think I'm grateful for every day. I wake up, yeah. And I have an opportunity to do something. Do you know what I mean? And um, and that choice is, is mine, really. And at the minute, I work three days with the community trust um, in Chesterfield. Yeah, I work on a mental health program, and um, and I've helped set up a cancer cancer recovery group. Mm. That's something I've want I wanted to do. And they've been able, to, they've been brilliant. They've been able to, you know, facilitate me doing that. And from my point of view, sitting down with people who are struggling with the mental health issues, if I can share my experiences and that helps them, that's, do you know what I mean? That's that's what I want, you know. And yeah, we've um, we've run a cancer coffee morning for four months now, and um, yeah, we've we have we've had such a great experience. You know, they've got people sat around the table with terminal illnesses, you know, and share, sharing their experiences and talking about, mm. you know, what they do in life and stuff like that, which, you know, you'd never get that. No. Else. And, and I always remember someone telling me a few years a, a few years ago about you'll do something and you'll get a warm, fuzzy feeling inside that money can't buy. Yeah. And that's what I live on at the minute, you know. I, mean, I, um, I certainly don't do it for the money or getting paid because... You know, ultimately, just feel they're a charity, um, and you know what I mean. So, I do it for the warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned there, obviously, the cancer support group, uh, Brightside, I believe that it's called. Um, you know, so like you say, it's just to get people together. You know, drawing your experiences, and just trying to help out. You know, people and. You know, I think that's the best feeling that anyone can have. Like you say, you know, you can have all the money in the world, but if you're all great, you know, it doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, so what happened was, when I first got diagnosed and I first sort of started getting better, I set up um, I set up Brightside as a support group for anybody and everybody, you see. So um, there's a helpline number on there and people want to ring up or message me, have a chat about anything they can do. Well, what I couldn't what I couldn't do, I didn't want to do, is, is, is have that as a job. So yeah. I got to a point where I needed to find work and get paid for it. And... So I sort of replicated what that was into a job at, at Chesterfield. So I spoke to a few football clubs in and around the region and just said, what are you doing? Can we do this? Chesterfield were one of the clubs who hadn't had anything set up. So it sort of made sense to go in and try and, you know, help and set up and facilitate what they were doing or what they wanted to do. And it gave me a job. It gave me a purpose, you know, and it, so it, it helps both parties. And so the, the support group at Chesterfield... Uh, the coffee one is through the football. Tr- the, 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 it's through the community trust and Brightside is a separate entity. You see. But um, so yeah, so from on and on the back of that, you know, what I mean, it's it, it it has worked really really well. You know, it's been it's been everything I wanted in my mind. You only have an idea of what you want to do and how yeah. you can see 
that so far that's how it is and how it's going along and we had a meeting last week about how we can develop that um and so we're, we're on the same track you know so um so yeah i'm, I'm really, really grateful for that opportunity and um and hopefully it continues for quite a long time yeah and that's the thing so like like you say just take each day as it comes and you just you know you just want to help more people out that's essentially yeah. what you're trying to do with it yeah definitely yeah yeah, yeah. I, I just i mean you talk you can talk about yeah i don't know i was really 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 close to dying do you know what i mean that's like and, I, and i'm really open about that do you know what i mean i mean i was in a terrible state yeah and for some reason it wasn't my time do you know what i mean someone someone somewhere sort of gone you know what i mean we'll give them a you know a, a stay of execution or, <laughs> uh, however you want to put it and yeah. uh, and i'm and i'm really open about that do you know what i mean but what i want to do is make sure i don't waste that opportunity yeah and i don't want to waste that opportunity so that's why you know I, I do what i do and i've done what i've done so um so yeah just sort of you know what i mean it warms warms the cockles of your heart you know and Mm. When, you, when you when you've had good days like that, I mean, I've I've literally my life how my life works is I um, just so so I've got a chest infection and, and an ear infection which I've had for nine weeks now. Okay. So my body isn't strong enough to get rid of it. You see, right? So I mean, I've, like the last night, eight or nine weeks have been horrific, as in coughing. And I've had earache every day for for nine weeks, mm. and I've literally just got to the point where. I've got antibiotics, which are actually send me, knock me bandy for like an hour every day when I have them. Mm-hmm. They're that strong. But I'm just coming to the end of it. Do you know, I, I can yeah. see light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, if we did this conversation last week, you wouldn't have heard us. You know, my, my voice was fairly terrible. Um, and um, so, that's, so that's sort of where my life is. Do you know what I mean? So if I pick up a cold. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh god, this how long is this gonna to take to get rid of, you see. So Yeah. Um so yeah, stuff like that. I mean I, I try to be active. Um I went for a walk yesterday with my partner and she uh she's been brilliant and helpful and supportive. Yeah, but that was the first exercise I've done since the beginning of January, you know, and mm-hmm. I was quite an active runner up until then, or a trundler. A runner's probably <laughs> like, you know, I used to trundle around and I was doing four or five miles mm-hmm. every other day. And then all of a sudden it just stops like that, you know. So that's sort of little things I have to deal with and get on with and mm. try and overcome. Yeah, I think as well, um, I think it's a lot more easier for people now, such as yourself, because obviously now COVID's, you know, I know it's still there, but it's not as bad now. So, you know, so that you have to be careful around that as well. Yeah, I mean, funny, well, I don't know if it's funny enough or not. I, I, never, I, I shouldn't, I, I never caught COVID, mm-hmm. but I was on that highly vulnerable list and however you want to call it and yeah actually um although I've, I, I've been double vaccinated i didn't take my booster but i was actually there's a double booster you know i could have mm. do you know what i mean so there's there's, there's there's four lots of injections i could have had um of which you know i got to a stage where i thought well i'm getting by at the minute and you know yeah. you know you just get through it and yeah we were again you know talk about focus and in living life to the full yeah so when when so we, we were on holiday when covid first started so we were abroad yeah we got back after the first lockdown my dad had a place in spain i went to see my dad in spain Um came back to another lockdown lock, the lockdown finished we went to Corfu for five days mm. now i'm not trying to be clever by saying oh i've gone all over the world but what i'm saying is every time there's a window of opportunity to do something yeah you know? um and that so so through covid the times like we were in lockdown and you sat in the house and my partner is, works um in the care industry so she still had to go to work you know i was furloughed and stuff like that you yeah. um, know what was it so yeah, you, you just you have to see an opportunity in, in every situation, you know. And the ones that, you know, if you grasp that, it, it, if you sit around waiting for things to happen, you know, I mean, the, 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 they take a long time to happen. You've got to make find things and make yeah. things happen and be proactive, and and that's what I think I am now, you know. And mm. I mean, 
December 2018, I was told I wouldn't live for 12 months. Mm-hmm. So, so I budgeted for money for, you know, for that 12 months. And mm. then all of a sudden, I live beyond that. And I'm like, I've run out of money. What I, what am I going to do? Do you know what I mean? So, right, if I run out of money, so I've got to find a job. Yeah. And that's why I ran the football clubs and said, do you do this? Do you do this? Can I get involved with that? Yes. So, so I, I believe now, you know, I'm, I'm proactive in what I try and do. And, um, and that, that's changed as well. And, um, yeah. And I talk about the, the, the focus, you know what I mean? you just got to, you got to grasp every opportunity that comes along. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think it's fair to say life's way too short. It really is. So you've just got to like, say, if you get a chance to do something, if you can do it, do it, because you just don't know how long, not just how long, got, how long you've got left, but unless this opportunity comes along. So that's just basically what you'd say to anybody. Yeah, definitely. I worked with a guy years and years ago, a sales manager. He had, not, he had a, a saying, and it took me ages to fathom it out. And he said, an opportunity only becomes an opportunity when it ceases to be one. Yeah, and I was like, at first I was like, no, I'm not very bright, so I was like trying to work. And then all of a sudden the penny drops. You know what I mean? Because we all sit there and go, tell you what, that was a great opportunity that I've just missed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I know I'm getting a bit deep now and all that, but you just want to. This is this is you know you, you get a wind of opportunity. And you go, well, if you think about it, it, it goes. You know what I mean? If you go yeah. With it, if I try something, at least if I try and fail. You've tried, yeah. You've tried, and you can learn something from it. If you don't do anything about your situation, then it, you know, you, you sort of get stuck in a rut. You see, so I'm on me uh, me biblical thing now. So <laughs> <laughs> anything to keep you going, mate. You know, what I mean, anything. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, um, just the last couple of questions. I don't want to keep you too much. No, I'm so, uh, just having a look. I never bloody stop talking. That's the other problem. So no, it's all right, mate. That's what I like to hear. Like you know, what I mean? <laughs> it's great. Um, so. What would you say? Would you say was the best manager that you played under in your football career, just in general? Um, Bubba Nick. So I had, <laughs> lots, I had lots of managers. I have to be really, really, really grateful to a guy called Willie McFall. He was Newcastle manager. Mm. He obviously must have been badgered from John Pickering to give me an opportunity, and he gave me an, he gave me the opportunity in my debut at Newcastle. And I just think at 16, 17 year old. You know, for for a manager to go, let's chuck him in and see what happens. You know what I mean? It's is yeah. is brilliant. You know, and uh, I know I know Willie still lives in um, Ireland. Um, unfortunately, uh, John Pickering passed away quite a few years ago now, and he was you know a, a massive part of my life um, or mm. my footballing life. So um, so yeah, I have to be grateful to them. But I think. From every manager I had, you learn something, you pick something up from them, and yeah. And I know we've, we've we we talked about this earlier on, but I think just being honest, yeah, you know what I mean, and belligerent is stands for a lot of things. And in the world nowadays, you don't always get that. You see, so no. some people don't like the truth. Do you know what I mean? Some people don't like telling the tr- you know telling the truth to somebody, and some people don't like accepting it. You see, so yeah, like the massive. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the best goal in your football career? Like they scored and who against? So again, I'll go back to Newcastle. I scored on my full debut with diving header in the Gallagher end mm. on a rainy day. So I ended up <laughs> in the back of the net. All the players were literally in there. Uh, Gaza was swinging on the crossbar. You just <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Thirty odd thousand in St James's Park and. It was probably the shortest goal I've scored. Uh, I headed it on the line, and but um, was was probably the most the, the one I'll never ever forget. You know, and, and I can remember, you know, remember all every minute, the whole minute around it and stuff like that, and stuff things like smells and sweat and you know what I mean. It was raining, and you know what I mean. It was just it's mm. never I'll never ever forget that. So um, yeah. yeah. It's probably not the most glamorous, but the most important one, to be honest. Because it gets you off and running, really. You know what I mean? Goes yeah. on in your career, one goal, and off you go, you know. So. <laughs> so, obviously, I'm sure you've seen the league table. See Mansfield now doing really well in the league. You know, what have you made of Mansfield, you know, watching from afar, like, you know, um, off, um, from a neutral point? No, I mean, it's it, it's it's very clear. I think the, the start of the season, well, didn't know, the first couple of games, now all of a sudden have a massive dip. And... I worked at Derby County and, and Nigel Clough was a the manager there and the staff he's got now were with him. Um, so I know Nigel, I know 
I've seen Nigel work and I know how hard he works and I know how competitive he, he has to be. Of all the people I've met, he's got to be the most competitive person I've ever met. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know he wants to win every game. And then, so you have it, you have it, so you've got a club which has probably spent a lot of money in the summer, invested well, and then all of a sudden drops to second, third, fourth bottom. Mm. And you can just see alarm bells ringing, you know, and, and I think what's been testament is everybody sort of held their nerve. And I mean that with owners and chief yeah. execs. Uh, it's easy, it'd be easy to fire someone and, you know, yeah. somebody else in. And I think they've, they've held their nerve. And, you know, I think it, it, it's shown that with experience, you know, and, and a bit of knowledge, you know, um, Nigel's been able to turn it around. And I was actually at the Colchester match. Oh, uh, yeah. The other night, I got invited as a guest to a friend of mine who's got a business and supports the club. And um, he, um, so I watched the game. Um, we had a bit of food. Um, it was, um, it was, you know, it was, it, it was refreshing to see. There wasn't that, I mean, especially the first probably half and maybe the hour, like the energy and the tempo they played that was really good. You know, they had scored loads of goals. I mean, um, the guy who scored the, the first goal from Hartlepool, uh, great finish, you know. Um, and, you know, they looked a very, they looked a solid outfit, really. You know, I think you know, it's a John Joe tool who was a yeah. star in my day, and oh, I knew him from that, and now slipped in his centre half. So, um, and then the two the two loan signings you look at, you know, you hopefully Matty Longstaff, obviously, I know briefly of his career at Newcastle. Yeah, you know, he's going to have massive experience in, in, in from quality and a good quality, and he's had a massive dip. So hopefully, he can get a bit of confidence back. And I know he scored at the weekend. So, and then uh, my memory is terrible. But the other chap that signed, you know, he's come for Rangers and yeah, a lot of experience as well. And um, so you just you, a lot of it is is, is momentum. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah. Mansfield, in the minute Mansfield got loads of momentum, you know what I mean? And if you're playing well. And you've got loads of games coming up, and you're winning games. Yeah, you know, it's if you're playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, it's irrelevant because you you enjoy turning up, and you know, you know, we've got a good chance of winning. So you just turn up, play, and win. Turn up, play, and win. You know, yeah. Win, win. The hard bit is when you've got all those games and you're losing. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's cold. It's wet. It's windy. <laughs> yeah. You know, a game on a Tuesday night. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. you know, it, it's it's it's. If you've got momentum going in the in the right way, it's hard to stop. Yeah, I mean, it's that that snowball effect. You know, you just let it roll and things will go. And you know, training probably just you're just taking over in training and training and going over one or two things like your fitness and your pattern play and stuff like that. It's all set up and has been all season. So yeah, um, so yeah, it's you get in that now you get into the end to the time of the season where you need to hold your nerve and mm. you know. Um, and it would be, you know, it'd be interesting to see where they, where they end up, you know, because obviously, you know, there's some, there's some big clubs in there. Forest Green have had a dip. I know they've got a big, um, big lead, but then you've got the like, Tranmere's and Northampton's. I think they'll drop points over the, the weekend or the last few yeah. games. And uh, you just got to keep chipping away, you know, keep chipping away and yeah. get into either the promotion places or the playoff places with momentum. You know, it's difficult to stop. Definitely. And that's that's all you've got to do. Like, and I think this is what I mean. It's like, we, it's weird because the start of the season, we had a bad run. But we've seen, so we've seen like both sides of it. So when it's not going for you, and I'm sure you've been in teams like you could be yourself, yeah. uh, you know, every shot, it just goes over the bar. Or, you know, if it's like an open goal, you miss it. It's just yeah. it goes against you. But when it goes for you, like you say, you know, you're just confident. It's just a massive thing in football. Yeah, I mean, like, confidence is everything in life. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. I remember there was one season, you talk about, I, I remember one season, uh, well, I say one season, I was only there too. I think the second season I was at Mansfield, personally, I hit the post or the bar 12 times throughout a season. <laughs> and I remember in the end, it got that it got that ridiculous. I started, I started keeping count. <laughs> um, and then you, so you just see, and you just talk like, if it goes you know two or three inches another way yeah all of a sudden you scored 20 goals in the season you know and like, yeah. <laughs> but it's if what's the maybes nowadays isn't it so yeah that's it mate um well, the last question for you mate um how would you uh 
Uh, describe your time at Mansfield overall. You know, what would your message be to the Stags fans that supported you at the time? Well, I'm really thankful because they gave me a chance. And it could have it could have gone really badly because, like you said, because of the the Chesterfield connection. Yeah. And what they were was they were honest. Do you know what I mean? And yes, they were prickly, and you know what I mean at the, at the beginning, which is completely understandable. But like you say, they were honest and honourable, and you know what I mean. I, I wore my heart on my sleeve, and and they appreciated that. And mm-hmm. I think when I go back to the club, you know, so, you know, I don't get any grief. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I, I always. People always, you know, speak and chatter, and which is, I suppose, when you when you leave a club, you want to leave a bit of an impression. Do you know what I mean? And and yeah. I have done that. You know, I can go back and walk around the town, and nobody bats an eyelid. And mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? So that that's what you know. That's from my point of view. That's what you want. You know, and I think I would say thank you to them because they were honest and honourable and give me that opportunity. Mm, definitely, and yeah. Uh... Also, best luck to you as well. This support group and like helping other people. I think it's. I think we should have more people like yourself. Just that helps people out, really. Oh, right. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's amazing. Obviously, you've been through a lot, obviously yourself, and I know you're still going through that to a certain extent. But it's nice that you can still give something back, even though you know obviously you've got a lot of things going against you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you say, we um, we started a mental health group last Monday, which is every every Monday at the club. So we've we've got that on running and. And obviously yeah. the, the cancer support group as well. So yeah, you, you know, you just do things which you hope, you know, will will help people in the future. Definitely. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate this, Tony. Uh, thanks for having, being a guest. Appreciate you taking your time. Uh, Save so of course. Thank you, mate. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, take care of yourself, mate. Thank you. See you, mate. See you, mate. Right. There we go.